Um, thanks for having us. I'm Ricard. I work for Runtime Verification. I usually work on KWASM. Uh, and I'm here with Sean Wei from NTU Singapore. And we want to tell you about K and how and why specifying solidity in K is a good idea. Uh, the K semantic framework is built on the idea that every programming language should have a formal semantics. So from a formal semantics, the K framework can automatically derive all the common software tools. This includes parsers, interpreters, but also more complex tools like compilers, model checkers, uh, deductive verifiers, and so on. So the complexity of work for generating T tools for L languages goes from T times L to T plus L. K is by no means a new technology. This framework has been developed for over 15 years. We use it heavily at runtime verification. There's lots of publications surrounding it. Uh, it is also proven very language and blockchain agnostic. So the formalism works for high level languages like Solidity, C, Java, low level languages like uh, Wasm and EVM. And we worked on different blockchains like Ethereum, Algorand, Tezos, and so on. Uh, it's, I just want to show you the formalism that K is based on. It's a rewriting formalism. Uh, so I'm going to give you a short example of what that looks like. The first thing you need to define uh, is the state that the rewrites should act on, which we call the configuration. It's built up of what we call cells. Uh, so here we have a configuration which contains the program to run in a cell that we name K. Uh, we have an environment for the current variables, which is a key value map. And we have a local memory storage. And more cells we don't really care about now. Ricard, anyway. I'm sorry to be interrupting, but um, the slides are kind of blurry. Is there an option that you either can share them with the audience or um, maybe Shang Wei could share her screen instead? Um, sure. Let's see. They are uh, kind of hard to read right now. OK. Uh, I can share my screen, but does it affect uh, Ricard's presentation? Uh, just uh, so we have some transitions, but we should be OK. I'll just say next slide or something. Um, OK. okay so let me turn off my. Let me try uh, as well. That would be great. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, so that just means that, that people will have to select the uh, uh, not the speaker's picture to see the slides, because the live stream follows the audio. Yes, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so let me share my, with my uh, slides. Great. And you can click through. There's a yeah. much click better quality. Through. Yes, okay, this well. is very sharp now. Thank you. OK. Hmm. Uh, yep, keep going. And yeah, here we come to syntax. So you write your syntax in typical EBNF form, uh, but we have these handy annotations. For example, strict two means that the second argument here is strict. So the right-hand side would be evaluated first. So that has, you can add some semantic meaning to your syntax declarations. Uh, if you go to the next slide, here's an example of what a rewriting rule looks like. And I'll just show you how it acts over a specific configuration. So here we have a configuration with, uh, the identifier foo and you assign three to it. Um, so, and you, you write your semantic rules with this uh, rule keyword. Um, let's see, uh, basically what we will do here is we will look in the current environment, find the pointer, uh, and then go to the storage and modify the value at that pointer. Yeah, so what you have this, I'll go back. Yeah, so the rule, uh, it's a rule keyword, and you see there are these little rewrite arrows. Those specify where the state is going to change. So next slide. Uh, so first, the assignment is going to match the uh, see here. Uh, the rewriting rules just applies to any configuration that its left hand side unifies with. So in this case, the configuration matches the rule. Uh, the assignment in the rule matches foo equals three with foo assigned to x and three assigned to y. Um, so actually, this might be a little annoying to do in this way. So let's just skip over the rewriting part. And I am happy to like explain this in detail to anyone later, or you can just look at the slides yourself. Um, so let's go to formal verification. Um, so basically, from a semantic written in this formalism, there's a straightforward way to reason about how uh, program execution. We click Next. The K framework derives a prover for free. 
And the basic idea is this. Uh, you treat every rule as an axiom. Next. Uh, you can do next three times. Um, you write a claim as a rewrite rule. Uh, then you s start from the left-hand side, apply all axioms that match branching whenever there's more than one thing that applies. And you just show that on every branch, you always reach this, a state that matches the right-hand side. So next slide. Uh, let's see. Maybe I show them all? Yeah, yeah, that's probably good. So basically, why should you bother making a formal specification um, in, or an executable formal specification? I'd say it's the best of both worlds. You get something that's readable and reasonably high level. Uh, if it's a case style, you can even write it in a literate style, inline it with your documentation. Uh, it's executable, obviously, so you get an always up-to-date, correct by construction reference interpreter. Everyone working on the formal verification tool can now do so properly in quotation marks because you actually have a formal definition of the language. I'm very curious to see what's going on on the SNTN uh, tomorrow uh, regarding this. But uh, yeah, ha having a, some formalism that describes the language is usually a good idea. I also find that it's a good prototyping tool for trying out language changes because uh, once you've hacked away on a language change in the compiler, for example, you can spe you need to specify it in a way that is ruthlessly unambiguous. And at least with K, the semantics are even composable, so you could write a separate semantics for, say, Yule, and include that in the Solidity semantics. And it actually shouldn't be that intimidating because it's defining a semantics is sort of on par with writing an interpreter in terms of work. So with that, I want to ask you to consider this statement that Solidity should have an executable formal semantics. Um, and with that, I just want to hand over to Xiang Wei, who has been working on just such a specification. OK, thanks, Rika, for the introduction of the key framework. Then I'm going to take over to introduce how we define the formal semantics of K, uh, of solidity in the K framework. Uh, to do so, actually, you need to define two components. The first component is the configuration, which indicates the status or state of smart contracts. If you look into the configuration file, actually, you'll find that it has two main parts. The first part marking the red color, which is for execution of a smart contract instance, while the second part marking the blue color is for recording the whole blockchain network status. And let's move, zoom into the red part, and you will see that we have a dedicated cell called execution engine uh, for execution of a smart contract instance. And inside this cell, we have several important cells for example, the call stack for function calls, either external or internal. Uh, we have call state, including the ID, which is the address of the current instance, the caller ID, call value, storage, local memory, etc. And if we look into the, the blue part, you can see that we have a, a cell called account in which we store all the contra instances that have been deployed on the blockchain including its address, its contract name, its balance, its storage, etc. Now let's move on to the second component uh, to define, that is a set of semantics rule uh, indicating how each solicit statement uh, behaves based on the current configuration as well as how it updates the configuration. Let me use this uh, statement as an example. So here we have a statement to declare a variable of unsigned integer uh, in storage, whose uh, initial value is three. And how do we define a semantics of this statement? We need to write a rule, a semantics rule for that. For example, here, if uh, we have in the case cell, we, we, we see this statement uh, of this syntax, we know that it's a variable declaration. So we try to rewrite this statement to uh, allocate term in K. Uh, it looks like this. And at the same time, we need to uh, look for necessary information and put it here. So for example, here, we need to know what is the current account that we are going to uh, declare this variable. So we need to look for its account ID. So we put it here together with the variable information, for example, the name of the variable, the expression, the, the, the value, the type, the location, etc. 
And then we move on to this allocate term. So when, whenever we see this allocate term in a case cell provided with the necessary information, then we are able to uh, do the corresponding arrangement in this account. That is to insert this, uh, this variable record in this account cell. Here I omit the, the details, but to sum up, to develop a, a formal semantics of solidity in the K framework, we need to define first uh, the configuration, second, a set of semantics rules like this for each statement. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the challenges that we met, that we face during uh, when we develop the semantics. The first challenge is that uh, Solidity is actually changing very fast in either in syntax or semantics. Currently, the latest version is 0 0.6, but if you look into the version history, uh, in average, uh, almost every month will have a, a version change, which is quite challenging for us to run after the frequent uh, version changes. The second challenge is that uh, the, the language description in the official document is not comprehensive usually complicated or corner cases are not mentioned. For example, if we are talking about function modifier, the following details are not mentioned. For example, what if the underscore statement is used for more than once? What if the modifier is inherited for more than once by a function, etc.? And we need to figure this out by ourselves based on some experiments, uh, which is quite time consuming. And the current status of case solidity, the project started in uh, the beginning of 2018, and until now we have two versions. Version one supports Solidity 0 0.4, and this table summarizes what are the features supported by our semantics. And as you can see that almost every core feature are su uh, is supported, except those uh, that are not, we are not able to support. For example, this inline assembly, basically this is EVM bytecode, and obviously it is out of the scope of Solidity itself. And since Solidity 0.5 was introduced, we plan to have a refactoring on, based on version one to version two to support Solidity 0.5. And currently we have finished core expressions and statements, and we're still working on some advanced features, for example, function modifiers, user-defined types, inheritance, etc. And now you can find our, uh, version two implementation on GitHub now. And with version two, actually you can do automatic testing or proving your smart contracts. And now I would like to share with you one of the interesting findings when we developed the semantics and it was back to uh, Solidity 0 0.4. And here we have a very simple test case that we use to test our semantics. And you can see that there's a very simple contract test uh, consisting of two state variables, A and B, with their initial values one and two respectively. And we have a function foo here in which we declare a local array D with two elements. And after that, we try to assign seven and eight to the two elements respectively. Now the problem is what are the values of A and B after the, we execute the function foo? Well, based on our semantics, A is still one, B is still two, but the program is stuck at this statement. And this is because uh, when we declare D, we don't specify the location. So by default, it will be in storage. And based on the semantics, it will be a reference to storage. But we don't have its initial value, meaning that we don't know where D points to. So whenever we want to execute this statement, we don't know where to store seven. However, if you try to execute this contra in the remix compiler, uh, I mean uh, 0 0.4 version, and you will find that the result would be A becomes zero and B becomes eight. And you may be surprised because you thought you are dealing with only local variables, but actually global variables are affected. And obviously uh, something went wrong here. So we, tr we reported this findings in our technical report in 2018 on archive. And after our investigation, we found that the Solidity 0.4 compiler implemented some implicit behavior, which is beyond developers expectation. And the, the, the problem comes from this, this statement. When we declare this function, uh, this array D, we don't specify the initial value, but for the compiler, it assumes that the default value will be zero. So actually D points to slot zero in the storage. 
So that's why when we execute this statement, the contents becomes like this. And when you execute this, the second assignment statement, the content becomes like this. So that's why A becomes zero and B becomes eight. And of course, this behavior has been fixed since Solidity 0.5. Now you need to specify the initial reference for D. Otherwise, the, compl uh, the compiler will complain about that. So uh, from this example, we can observe that uh, uh, the formal semantics of Solidity is very important, especially for developers. Well, uh, now I would like to summarize uh, this talk by uh, introducing the possible application of case Solidity. First of all, uh, our semantics is fully executable, executable meaning that uh, you can execute your smart contract based on our semantics and you will have an output configuration. Actually, you can have the output config configuration after each statement. And you can do formal verification. You can have some assertions in your smart contract and our tool can help you to do symbolic execution to check whether the assertion will fail or not. Or you can even try to prove that your smart contract are correct. But of course, you need to specify the properties. And then you can even do compiler verification. Uh, this is what you can do. For example, you, you have a smart contract, right? You can run your smart contract based on our semantics, then you will have an output configuration. And in, in, in the other hand, you can uh, compile your smart contract by a compiler and you have your uh, by, uh, EVM bytecode and you execute your bytecode and you have your real output. And after that, you can compare the two outputs to do course validation if they are not consistent, meaning that something's going wrong. And last but not least, you can even do semantics consistent checking. For example, how do you know that the behavior in the solidity level conforms to that in the EVM bytecode level? To do the consistent checking, actually you need the formal semantics of EVM which is supported by another project, KEVM, from uh, runtime verification. All right, I think that's pretty much I want to share with you today. Uh, I think Rico and I would, would be happy to take questions if we still have time. Yes, you still have a couple of minutes. So feel free to ask questions in the Solidity Gitter chat or right here in the room. Okay, yeah, somebody's raising his hand. I see it already, L LA. Leo, yes. Hey guys, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, wait, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so this stack, a case loaded to KVM, of course, makes a lot of sense and it's super nice. But suppose, like, let's assume that K Yule exists. Would it? How much easier would K Yule, like, case loaded to K Yule and K Yule to KVM? B, if you want to verify the whole stack, then the single, sort of like the single large step from K solidity to KVM. Uh, Ricard, are you going to answer? Yeah, sure. Uh, do, so you mean for compiler verification? Like in verifying um, it in the intermediate steps or? I right, think simple, like yeah. if you have if you have the source code and then you have the compiled white care, then you want to check equivalence, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be the same thing in the sense that you would, uh, if you have a complete semantics of Yule, you could symbolically execute your program and then you could check that. I mean, the, the, the tricky part is to find sort of equivalence, like figuring out, well, you know, we expect this value to be output or stored somewhere where by EVM, uh, just correlating that to, you know, the corresponding part of the solidity configuration. I, I mean, it, it would be the same thing, I think, but, um. I mean, it depends sort of on how the semantics are written and, but in principle, it should be uh, the same or simpler. Actually, I have something to add up. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we try to um, define a formal semantics of solidity, we try to keep the configuration as, this, as much the same as uh, EVM as possible. For example, we, we still keep the gas uh, transaction number, et cetera. We, we try to keep it as the same as possible. This is because we want to do the consistency checking. Although some of the cells, we cannot use it. For example, the gas cell. Actually in the solidity level, you don't know actually how each statement consumes how many gas. So we just put it there and have some estimation. One way is to you compile your uh, solidity contract into a 
EVM and can calculate the gas and get back to solidity level and put into the, the gas cell. So uh, I think uh, if you want to do the consistent checking, that would be not difficult because 80% of the, the, the configuration are the same. 